So the second part, I guess it will be slightly less, there will be fewer theorems, but I'll try and sort of look at the applications of some of the things that we introduced to more classical machine learning techniques. So I still won't go deep into any sort of more practical sides of machine learning, but I will talk about models that are commonly used in, in machine learning, or at least, well, some of them. So the neural networks won't be exactly the, like the kind of things that people are doing to get sort of good results with cats and so on, but it's, I'll mention some of the more theoretical results that a few of them that have um, are about neural networks. Okay. So, um, so let's start with the binary classification problem again. And so we already discussed that if you have, if you're given data and let's say it's nice and cleanly separable, so you have positives on one side, negatives on the other side. Uh, I managed to make this work, but apparently it doesn't. Okay. Um, and you want to find just a, a linear separator, right? So the separates something, a line that separates the positives from the negatives in this case. Uh, and if it is, if there is a linear se separator, then we know that we can find it efficiently. So we already discussed that briefly. And we'll classify all the points correctly. But as you can see in this picture, there's, well, there's many such linear separators, so there's not just one. And one question is, well, which one should you pick? And is there a good basis for picking one over the other? Now, if we just apply the empirical risk minimization principle, it doesn't really tell us. It just, all of this have, these have zero risk on the data we see, so all of them are equally good. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, we would probably, none of us would pick maybe like this green one going there, which is, is a bit too close to one of the blue points and there's some danger that it might misclassify something. And this is what um, we want to discuss next. And this whole theory of support vector machines really, so, so Vapnik, who introduced the main, the Vapnik behind the uh, VC dimension and who really introduced the statistical learning theory framework was also very influential in sort of developing the theory around support vector machines and kernel machines. Okay, so, so the principle there is, is, which is called the maximum margin principle, is that if there's many separators, then in that case, you should pick a separator that maximizes the distance of the closest point from the boundary. Okay, so, so you look at, so every point, there's some distance to the boundary, and you want to find, for any such separator, the closest point, and that's your margin, right? So, so that's how much room you have to make errors because that's, that's, you know, that's you're getting too close in certain case. And in that sense, you would actually pick this one because this was, in this example, this is the black line on the right side is the one that, that finds the maximum margin classifier. So that's what you would pick. And the points that are closest in that setting are the ones that are called, are called support vectors. And the reason for that, why they're called support vectors was, will be clearer, but you can think of them as supporting these, these hyperplanes. So, well, what are these margins? So in case it's been a while since you've seen high school geometry, let me quickly recount what exactly these distances from these linear separators really means. So if you have a hyperplane in, in n-dimensional space, so given by this w dot x plus some w zero being equal to zero, so that's a hyperplane, you have some point in Rn, how far is, x from this hyperplane. And it's actually fairly simple to show that, in fact, it's given by this quantity here, oops, which is, uh, well, okay, this is the calculation. If you look at w dot x plus w zero, the absolute value of it, divided by the norm of the vector w, and that gives you the distance, which is what you get. So that's, that's going to be your margin, right? So, now, if you, you also might be misclassified, so this is what's, what's important, is all of the points that are labeled positive, so y, with y being equal to plus one, you want the w dot x plus w zero as indeed non-negative, and for points labeled minus one, you want it to be negative. So you want them to be right on the right side, and you know that for any such point, this is the margin. And we want to find the maximum margin classifier. Okay, so that's, that's the setup. Um, what's the actual way to find such a maximum margin classifier? This is what the actual formulation for support vector machines is. And let's maybe spend a little bit of time understanding why this is equivalent to finding the maximum margin. Um, 
so you have, okay, so the optimization problem here says you want to minimize the square norm of W subject to these constraints, where yi times this quantity w dot xi plus w0 should always be greater than or equal to one. So, okay, it's written down there so you see what it is. So what is the margin if you find some w satisfying this solution? Um, and so why, why is this one over the norm of the vector in u? Right, okay, so, it's, uh, so, so you know that the margin is at least one over w, w star based on that because you know that this is gonna be at least one. It, and, and in fact, when you do the optimization for at least one of the points, you will have to satisfy this inequality with equality. Otherwise, you could actually find a, a smaller w and this is why you really, so you get that the margin is really exactly that because that's what you would get as the solution. And so what we've achieved by, you know, so this rather complicated looking expression for margin is not really that complicated. And now we have a much cleaner optimization problem to solve because we have fairly nice constraints. They're just linear inequalities really. Uh, so W is the only unknown in this, W and W zero. So we have linear inequalities as constraints, M of them, and we have a simple quadratic function as, as our objective. And so it's actually a convex, so if you're solving, minimizing a convex function over a convex set, so it can be solved using standard convex optimization techniques. So that's, that's good. So these problems can be solved efficiently. Um, so that's, so it's common to go, to actually solve this using the dual frame, dual of this primal problem, even though in principle there is, uh, it's a convex optimization problem and we could solve this. And I've written the dual there, but maybe I'll spend a little bit of time saying how one got to this. And um, I'll, okay, so, so here's our primal, primal formulation, which we started with. And okay, it disappears at some point. Okay, anyway. So, um, right, so here's on the left, we have our primal, uh, primal problem. Uh, we can write the Lagrange function associated with it, uh, with these Lagrange multipliers alpha i, and then if you take the derivatives of this, maybe I'll, maybe it's a, since I put it on the slide, but I'll write it. So one of the things, if you take the derivative with respect to w, what you really get, so the gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to w is, in this case, minus sum over i from alpha i y i x i, and we want, we're going to set this to, to zero. And then you can also take derivatives with respect to W zero and that will, and substituting that into the Lagrangian will really give you the, the dual version, which you now want to maximize. And the constraint you get is by taking the derivative with respect to, this is that the sum of alpha i y i equals zero. There's something that's worth noting in this form. What it tells you is that this W can always be written as a linear combination of your vectors x. So the solution you find is going to be some linear combination of, of the vectors in your data set. And, and in fact, this is, if you look at these complementary slackness conditions, it says that alpha i times um, this quantity is zero. Um, so, so this means that if alpha is non-zero, then this quantity must be zero. Right, so yi times w dot xi plus w zero minus one must be zero if alpha is and not zero. So in fact, any, any vector xi which contributes towards the solution will be sitting exactly on the margin. So that sense. So if you look at, if you interpret this condition, if alpha is not zero, then this is zero. The fact that this quantity yi times w dot xi plus w zero minus one is zero means precisely that this point is exactly at, on the margin. That's the closest point to the separating hyperplane because those, con con those inequalities are satisfied with equality and, and those points contribute to the solution. And this is the sense in which they actually support vectors. So those are in the support of this linear combination that's giving us the solution. And these are these points that are the ones that are defined. So these are, this is why they're really called the support vectors. Okay, so this is um, a nice picture for 
you know, for what happens when the data is, is nicely linearly separable, of course, this is not um, often going to be the case in practice, so we have to do something else. And well, what do we do? So most likely our data will actually look like this. And we've already established that that we cannot find a separator that minimizes the number of misclassification unless p equals np. So we have to find some other relaxation that we are able to solve. And this is what the SVM formulation does for the non-separable case. And that's by introducing these slack variable zetas. So instead of these inequalities, which said that this should be greater than one, we're going to allow some slack there. So we just going to insist that they're larger than one minus zeta i. And zeta i's are going to be non-negative. So we can always set zeta i's to be enormously large and satisfy all of the inequalities. And this would, of course, mean that we might get meaningless solutions. So, so we have to penalize the slack somehow. So we don't want there to be too much slack. So we're allowing these inequalities to be somewhat violated, but we want to minimize the overall violation of these inequalities. And so these are all non-negative non slack variables. And so the way we can enforce that is by adding this extra term to the objective, which is the sum of all the slack variables. It's, uh, so if the data were indeed separable, we would actually get back to our original setting if we chose the correct value of C. Right? So there's also this un undefined quantity C there. So, so there's so there's a trade-off there. So the question is, well, how much do we value having a low norm W, and how much do we value having penalties? So if there's not much penalty for slack, so if C is very, very small, then even if the data is linearly separable, it might try to make some errors and find a W that has, that has a very small norm. But uh, on the other hand, if C gets very, very large, then if the data is separable, <coughs> then it will, it will try to make sure that all slack variables are indeed zero because that will be the optimal solution. So, so once we introduce this formulation, it might so happen if we don't choose the correct C that even for data that was linearly separable to begin with, we might end up with, with a solution that doesn't actually get zero training error. So this is something to keep in mind. Okay. So any questions about this? Okay. So. So one way to think of this formulation really in more sort of, again, more traditional approaches in machine learning area, you can think of this as, as a combination of a regularizer and a loss function. And so in that sense, what is it a loss function? So, so we understand minimizing the sum of squares of the parameters is usually what regularization is, uh, how regularization is done in machine learning methods. And then we have this extra thing which we want to interpret as a loss. And this is actually the loss function that we're looking at, so it's the hinge loss. So, so, what, so why is this the correct loss? So if you look at the optimal solution, we're always going to have zeta i. So zeta i's are required to be non-negative, but we would never want to set them to be anything more than this quantity, so max of zero and one minus that quantity, right? So, so they're always required to be non-negative, but we would always want them to be as small as possible because, that's because they're being penalized in the objective function. And, and this quantity, max of zero and this, is exactly this function plotted here. So let's maybe say what it is saying is, in, in words, what this tree is saying. So it says that if you classify the point correctly, so yi is the same sign as w dot xi plus w zero, and in fact, this product is at least one, then there is no loss for that point at all. So you're, you're classifying it correctly and by a margin of at least one, or this quantity is at least one. Um, on the other hand, you're even sometimes penalizing points that are misclassified as long as this, it fails to be at least one. Right? So even if you're on the right side of the hyperplane but you're too close to the hyperplane, you're still being penalized. In that sense, there's still a penalty for being too close to the boundary of the separating hyperplane. So that is what this loss function is really doing. Okay. okay. So, so in, in some sense, you can think of this in the more traditional view as being minimizing a loss function plus a regularization term. Usually you would have a parameter lambda on the regularization and said here you have the loss, but you know, there's always a setting of C that you will give you exactly the same kind of objective function. 
Okay, so now the dual gets slightly more complicated when you have the slack variables, but not too much more. So we start with our primal formulation, and again we can write out the, the Lagrangian. So we start with the, the objective function, and then for each of the constraints, so they're all inequality constraints, so all our Lagrange multipliers have to be non-negative, and we get these, these terms. So the Lagrange multipliers here are the alpha i's and the mu i's. And if you, so here I've done it explicitly, so if, in case you're wondering how I got the dual version, is precisely what, what is going on. So we take the derivatives of this Lagrangian with respect to the parameters of the primal, in the primal problem, so w, w0, w and all the zetas, and we set all of them to zero and add the dual feasibility constraints that the, the Lagrange multiplier should be non-negative. And so again, it's, it pops out exactly the same thing that this w has to be written as a linear combination of your input data vectors. And it's, if any of you are wondering, there's a reason why you get this sum of alpha i y i equals zero, zero as one of the constraints. And it's, it's a good exercise to try and understand that because what, is, what it's really saying is that you, you're putting equal weight on the positive and negative support vectors somehow. And that, that's what that constraint is setting in your solution. And, and it's important that that's how it's done. So try and that's a good exercise to think why it makes sense from a maximum margin perspective that that's, that's the constraint should pop out of this objective. And right, so we can substitute this and we get a, a maximization problem is as part of the dual, which is this function g of alpha, and which is, so the mu's disappear actually. They're, instead of that, we get this constraints on alphas um, between, to lie between zero and c and this one const equality constraint as well. And that's our, so, so, we are max, so this is a maximization problem, but luckily this is also a concave function and this shouldn't be surprising. So we had a convex function that we were minimizing in the primal and now we're getting a concave function that we are maximizing in the dual. So this should, this should make sense. So, so can anyone think of why one might want to solve the dual rather than the primal version of this problem? So it's, Yes? Uh, it's, a, it's okay, so the suggestion is you can do it in a more efficient manner, so in, in what sense? Okay, so I'll come to the gram matrix in a bit. So that's, that's okay, so there's, so there's one reason that we, we can start kernelizing these methods and, and the dual makes a lot more sense when we talk about kernels. But so there's also this, um, if you look at the primal constraints, there were these you know, somewhat unwieldy looking inequalities, so w dot xi plus w0 times yi is zero, which gives you some polytope, which could be slightly strange, whereas the dual constraints are actually very, very nice, right? So all it says is that all of the dual variables lie in a box, and then there's this one hyperplane on which all of them must lie, which is much nicer than these somehow unwieldy primal constraints. And that's just from purely from solving the optimization problem, it's much nicer to solve the dual than solving the primal. So this is also something to keep in mind. So you know, it, you, know you do want to solve these problems in the real world and you'll run them and you want to try and make them run as efficiently as possible. Okay, but this, the point about kernels is also important and we'll come to it just in a little bit. Okay, so this is, just to summarize, here's the primal and the dual form. And, and, and then these complementary slackness constraints basically again tell us that alpha i times this quantity is, is zero, which again is exactly saying that if alpha i is, is non-zero, then you're going to have, this, this constraint is going to be satisfied with in equality and these, in this case, will be your support vectors again. So the ones for which you're achieving, you're sitting on the margin. And then this is, the margin no longer necessarily has a good geometric interpretation, but it does mean that you're on the, that, the part of the hinge loss that's not going to be zero. So you're not going to be there and you have this. Okay. And so this is the, the support vector. So this is our picture again. Okay, so, so when I go through these margins and, and what, what does it really tell us, if, you, if we try to connect it back now to our 
statistical learning theory approach of, of trying to give generalization bounds. So this is all about, so far we've just said, here's our training data, can we find a linear separator, can we find one fast, can we find one that makes sense? But we haven't talked anything about what it would say about data that we haven't seen from the distribution, and that's what we want to make connections back to this, right? So, so, so it's a binary classification problem, so we could just resort to VC dimension again. So what's, what's the VC dimension of linear separators in n dimensions? Someone, uh, right. Okay, so okay, so it's, it's, it's n plus one, right? So it's so it's, it's one more than the dimension, and and if you if you haven't seen it, then it's also a, a nice exercise to actually show that this is the VC dimension for linear separators in n dimensions. So right, so if you could derive bounds directly using only the VC dimension, and and you will get some kind of generalization bounds in the sense that it says that if you have samples larger number of Example is larger than some quantity, then you get some kind of generalization, and, and that's perfectly fine. But the question is, well, we went through all this trouble of having a max margin formulation, and we were not just choosing any hyperplane, but some more reasonable hyperplanes, and the question is, can we get a generalization bound that somehow depends on the margin? Right? So that's what we would like to pop out of this, this kind of analysis. So, so in order to do that, we will look at a different cost function. And so I'll call, it's called gamma rho. And I'll define it from r cross minus one, one to zero. So the first argument can be any real number. The second one is always going to be minus one, one. So the second argument of the cost function is always the observed label. So in this case, it's just going to be minus one or one. Um, and the first argument could be any real number. And this is going to be defined as through this function phi rho, which is a bit like the hinge loss, but not exactly. So we're going to clamp it to one if the sign of, so if z is, is negative, um, then it's going to be, it's just, it's just going to be one. If z is at least rho, it's going to be zero. And in between, it's just going to be some linear thing so that the whole function becomes continuous. Right. And in some sense, what we're really looking at is Points that are misclassified, well, we're just going to penalize them one. Points that are classified correctly with a decent margin, they're going to be, there's going to be no loss associated with them. And points that are classified correctly, but you know, maybe a bit too close to the boundary, there's going to be some penalty, depending on how close to the boundary you actually are. So that's, that's what this cost function is actually doing. Okay, so, so hinge loss you know, penalizes explicitly, even if you're very far from the boundary on the wrong side, it keeps you penalizing more and more. And it makes sense from optimization point of view, but ultimately, if you're only interested in binary classification, we can really just count the cost of it as one. Once you have misclassified, there is no point in assigning it more cost than that. Okay, so, so this is what we're going to use to prove generalization. Now, let me add that this is not the optimization problem that we are going to solve. So this is, we're still going to solve using the SVM formulation because this will not give us a convex optimization problem. This is not a convex function, whereas the hinge loss is a convex function. So we, will, we do actually get a convex optimization problem, whereas we couldn't directly optimize with this kind of a cost function. So this is really just to analyze the generalization bounds, not to do any optimization. Okay, so, so we're going to restrict ourselves to looking at um, these linear functions, again, which have a bound. Uh, the norm of W is bounded by, by some capital W, and if we're looking at X, again, the norm of X is cap bounded by capital X uh, for all the, these vectors. And this function phi rho is, is indeed um, one over rho Lipschitz, so we can apply and Talagrand's lemma, again, or some instance of Talagrand's lemma, and get this kind of a bound in the Radomacher complexity uh, if we want to use it to understand this loss function. Right. Okay, so what, does, what is it exactly that we are going to apply this, this on? So I'm going to look at yet another loss function, a cost function, and this is our familiar one. So this is 
simply our classification loss, right? So gamma, gamma of y prime y is, is if, I, if I just had to make a prediction, no margins, nothing, then I would just use the sign of y prime, so whatever, so, so my SVM returns me a linear function, so it gives me a w, a w and w0, I look at w dot x plus w0, it has, I look at its sign, and that tells me which side of the hyperplane I'm on, and that's going to be my prediction. So this is, so gamma is simply looking at the prediction given by the, by the support vector machine classifier. So this is just a zero one loss. Gamma rho is this, this loss that we defined in the previous slide. So the first thing to notice is that um, gamma of y prime y is always smaller than gamma rho of y prime y, right? And this is really because, you know, whenever uh, gamma y prime y is, uh, is one, the gamma rho is also one, so maybe I, I should have put the picture on this slide, but the picture really is that this is what gamma rho looks like, and this is what gamma looks like. So point-wise, it's always, it's always smaller, and, and that's, that's good because, so we can say something about the loss on the classification problem in terms of what we can say about the risk with respect to gamma rho, because it's always going to, it's always going to be an upper bound on the classification error. Okay. okay, so we can refine again the risk, which is with for both of these. So R, I will simply use for the risk for the classification error, so it's simply the sine of W dot X and Y. And our rho is, again, the risk with respect to this gamma rho function. And for both of these, I uh, will just use hat r and hat r rho to define, denote the corresponding empirical risks. So you have your training sample, so your air risk on the training sample is given by r hat and r hat rho. And so now we get the following, a following kind of bound, which tells us that if you look at the R of H, which is the risk of any hypothesis here, uh, which can always be bounded by R rho of H, because using the first set line up there, which then we can bound using this Radomacher complexity theorem, which is at most the empirical error, plus something that depends on the Radomacher complexity of this composition of phi with H. Okay. So what is this Radomacher complexity? We already had it on the previous slide, which was um, Wx over rho times, well, I have rho there? Yeah, so rho times square root of m. And, and this is where this margin really shows up. And W also is what also controls the margin, right? So, so, there's, so we want to choose rho basically that matches W. So, so one over W is going to be your margin. And you will set rho to be the same thing. So, so you get, something that actually depends on your margin. And so in this case, you know that this, the sample size of size roughly w square x square over rho epsilon square is sufficient to get epsilon, excess risk of epsilon over what you observe on your sample. Okay, so what's, what's to note in this case? Um, so it doesn't depend on the dimension directly at all. Right. So it depends on various, so if, if there is a dependence on dimension, it possibly comes through norms. Right. So if you have a vector in a much higher dimensional space, it's quite likely that they will have higher norm that somehow depends on the dimension, but, but the dependence on dimension here is com comes in entirely through the norm. So there's no explicit dependence on the dimension. So somehow if your data lies in a high dimensional space, but has the correct norms bounded by a small quantity, and it's also the case for you can actually find some linear function that has a small norm, then, then your generalization error is controlled only by some function of these norms, but not by the dimension. Okay, so this is, so this is crucial. So somehow, if you use VC-like bounds, you, you have to pay dimension because the VC dimension of half spaces is, is n plus one, and you always get that. Whereas using this, you can actually go through this and make sure that if you're, you know, the fact that you can do this with small norm on W essentially says that there is a large enough margin, right? So if you have a large margin, it means you can find something, the norm of W is not very large. And, and this allows you to actually use the fact that you have a, a large margin 
solution to your problem that, that will give you a better generalization bound than if you just use the VC bounds out of the box. Okay, so any questions on that? I, I, important to note is that although, the, although we're giving a bound on the classification error, we, it's not in terms of the best classification error on the training data set, right? There's this funny loss on the training data set, and we don't even know actually whether we've we've optimized with respect to that loss function. The, the loss function that we've optimized on the training data set is the hinge loss with some regularization. And, and what all we can say is that if we so happen to have a small, small value for that loss, then actually our classification error on the true data is, or to the true classification risk is also not going to be very large. But this by no means guarantees that we found anything close to optimal. And so that's important to keep in mind that the quantity here is not anything to do with the empirical risk of the same kind that we are looking on the left-hand side. So we can, we can give an upper bound on the classification loss under the true distribution in terms of training loss on the so empirical risk with respect to other loss functions. And that's precisely because we have that upper bound, that you can always upper bound the classification loss by this, this funny gamma rho function. Yes? So, okay, so I'm not, I haven't seen that. So what, what, okay, what can be done, which I have seen, is um, if you do have a large margin linear separator, you can actually apply some dimensionality reduction techniques to show that you actually you can also get a, a linear separator in a smaller dimension. And, and you, can, you can argue that that way, that you actually maybe a VC dimension is an overkill if you do have a large margin. Because if you don't have a large margin, if you do dimensionality reduction, it tells you nothing. But, but you can actually do some dimensionality reduction because of the margin that you actually have. And, and I forgot who did that stuff, but it's, it's been done. Okay. Okay, so, so that's... Right, so this is this point that we're not really uh, solving the NP-hard problem anyway. We're still hiding that away by saying that... All we're saying is that if, if by magic, you happen to have small enough loss for the hinge loss on your training set, then your classification error and expectation is also not going to be very large. And that's what, that's what this kind of a bound is telling you. Okay. Okay, so let's me now talk a bit about kernels. And, and this is why this idea of not using dimension-dependent bounds becomes even more important, because once we start talking about kernels, we're really going to possibly be looking, living in infinite dimensional space. And these kinds of bounds will still apply as long as we can bound the correct norms. Okay, okay so what's, what is this notion of kernel? So if we go back to the dual formulation of SVM for a bit, so we can think of having the data matrix. So we can write the data as a matrix form. So we have these <laughs> vectors x1 through xm. And I can put all of them in the matrix. So the ith row of this matrix x is, is the vector data point xi. And I can write this, uh, this product, xx transpose, which is, you can denote by k, which is every entry is simply the inner product between the two of my training vectors. A, so that's, and this is called the gram matrix. And this is positive semi-definite just by construction, because I've written every entry as a set of inner products. And what we can do is, we can ask the following question. So we can perform basis expansion. So what is basis expansion? So, so, so far we've been looking at linear classifiers. So I have some data, I try to find a linear separator, and, and that's it. Well, we can try and ask, well, what happens if my data is not linearly separable? And this is sort of the common example that we get, which is, you know, so what if my data looks a bit like this? I have all these positive points here and maybe some negative points here. Right? And so I, I don't really have a linear separator, but, but maybe I do have 
you know, a quadratic separator or a cubic separator or you know, some, if, I'm, if I'm willing to use a, to threshold a slightly higher degree polynomial but not just a linear threshold, then I could get a separator for my data, which I couldn't otherwise get. And, and this is what kernels are going to prove useful for. Right? So if you don't want to directly use kernels, we can do what's called as basis function expansion. So we simply take our data and we construct higher order monomials from the data itself. So we just look at the squares, the quadratic terms, the cubic terms, and so on, and we can get new data points in a possibly much larger dimensional space. And now what was a polynomial in the original space is simply a linear function in the expanded space. So that's, that's the idea of basis function expansion. So we're just trying to use all our linear methodology in a higher dimensional space, and that's what basis function expansion gives us. And, and all that will change in this case here is that instead of using you know, x, xi transpose xj, or the inner product of xi and xj, I'm going to have to replace these entries in this matrix by the inner product of phi of xi and phi of xj. Okay, is that... Okay, so, so the key thing to note is that if you, solve, if you want to solve the dual version of the problem, all we need is the entries of this matrix. Right? So we don't, need, we don't need any of the, we don't need to know the data explicitly even, we just need to know the entries of this matrix, and so as long as we could compute these inner products of phi of xi and phi of xj, we are perfectly fine. Okay, so let's have a look at some example just to get a sense of how this is done. So this is thing called, you'll hear the word kernel trick, and what does this really mean? It's really a computational trick. So let's say you want the ability to express you know, thresholds of quadratic functions. Uh, if you start with original data, let's say it's two-dimensional data, what I would construct is this map, which maps x, which is just x1 and x2, to this vector, which has 1, x1, x2, x1 square, x2 square, x2. And so now I can represent all possible quadratic functions, and I can threshold it, and this would just be linear in terms of psi of x. Right, great. Um, but instead of using this map, I can also use this slightly curious looking map, which is not that different, except there's some funny square root of twos hanging out here and there. But it's, it will still allow me to express any quadratic function as, as before. Uh, what have we gained by, by doing that? If, if we use phi instead of psi, we can, we can try to write the inner product between phi of x and phi of x prime, and it nicely simplifies into just this nice looking quantity here, which is one plus x, the inner product of x and x prime to the power d. Right? And what this means is that computationally this is much better, because if I want to fill in the entries of the kernel matrix, I don't have to actually compute all these possibly n to the d entries if I'm using a d degree polynomial, write them all out and look at the inner products. I could just do this. And this is actually just takes linear time or maybe linear and log the degree of the polynomial. But, but it's, it's very, very efficient computationally. It's definitely not going to take n to the d time. And so this is what you, 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 the kernel trick actually means, is that somehow if you use a proper kernel, you're going to get computational savings, you don't have to actually explicitly perform any kind of basis function expansion. Okay, okay so, so let's, we, so we have this kernel trick idea, so we, can, we will call this a kernel matrix, in fact this one plus x x prime square, I can directly define that to be my kernel, and if I define say kappa to be that, I can just fill up this matrix by computing kappa, and what we want is this property from kernels called as them, they should be positive definite or sometimes called Mercer, Mercer kernels or satisfy Mercer condition. What the condition essentially says is that if I fill up this matrix, I should always get a positive semi-definite matrix. So if I pick any M points and fill out this matrix, I should always get a positive semi-definite matrix. If that happens, we will call such a kernel a positive definite kernel. Um, so maybe just a quick question. So why do we want a positive definite kernel, do you think, out of curiosity? So it's again actually an optimization issue more than anything else. So if you have a positive definite kernel, you get a convex function that you want to maximize, 
when you're solving the SVM problem. So it's, it's not so much about learning or representations. It's not directly a statistical issue. It's really an optimization question. So you can, you actually, as long as K is, is positive, positive semi-definite, you're going to get a convex function that you're minimizing or a concave function that you're maximizing. Okay. Right, so, so a dual formulation of, of support of SVM is simply this, so you're looking at this, where instead of the inner products between Xi and Xj, as you had, you're simply now replacing it by the ijth entry of this kernel matrix, and, and you can solve this, and now you're possibly solving, you're finding a linear separator in a much higher dimensional space, because you don't actually know, you know in, you, if you know it's a polynomial kernel, you know what that space is, but nothing is stopping you from just defining any kernel you like, as long as it's positive definite, and which is not always easy to check, you can actually use it and you can get increasingly more complex classifiers. Okay. So, okay, so how do you predict on a new point? So, so if you had explicitly this feature vector w, then it's nice because prediction is easy, you just compute w dot x, you check its sign and you can make a prediction. Uh, now, if you have this kernel form, all you have these are these alpha i's, which is a bit, uh, which is a bit strange, and you need to be able to make a prediction. And if you want to make a prediction, then what you need is, you need to keep all the support vectors in your solution, and you have to be able to compute this quantity kappa, the kernel xi with the new point that you want to make a prediction on, multiply them by the corresponding alpha i's, and that gives you exactly what what the prediction is. So, so, so the prediction, so there's a trade-off there. So if you solve the dual, um, you do, in, the, in this sense, the prediction does become slightly more tricky because you now have to compute the kernel with everything in the support vector, which also means that you always have to keep your training set. So you cannot just keep a set of vector, uh, one vector as, as your output hypothesis and then get rid of your training set. If you're deploying your classifier, you actually always have to keep your training set. Right. The other sort of issue is also that these algorithms are inherently quadratic in the sample complexity. So you, you, at the very least, you have to build this kernel matrix, and this is already going to be quadratic in size of your data, and this is so computational cost that you have to pay. Okay, okay so, so here's some examples of kernels. So there's this polynomial kernel, which we can use, which we already discussed. And more commonly, what people is, will use is what's called as um, the Gaussian kernel, or sometimes also just called the radial basis function kernel. But the radial basis functions are more general. And all it says is that the value of the kernel at points x and x prime is x of the square distance between them divided by some two sigma square. And this two sigma square, the sigma here controls the uh, the scale. Uh, okay, sorry about that. We didn't actually look at kernel kernel ridge regression, but don't. Uh, so, so, so if sigma is very large, so, so, so think of what sigma is doing. So if sigma is very large, maybe I'll draw a picture to try and explain what these algorithms are doing. So remember that our class, our final classifier is looking at functions of the following form. So, so this is what we're really trying to fitting. So we've, we, we we're learning a function which is given by these alpha i's which are obtained by solving the dual, and we get some new point. We want to make a prediction there. And the function we're computing is we're computing the kernel with all of them and weighting it correctly, and then that's giving us our prediction. So this is what what is going on here. And then we'll apply a sine function to it to get the binary prediction. And But if you think about what this is really doing is you, if you have a Gaussian kernel, what you're really doing is you're putting it sort of a Gaussian at various points in, in space at corresponding to your x size. It could be negative and it, depending on alpha, they could be scaled and so on. But you're really just looking at a linear combination of some of Gaussians. You're trying to represent a function as a linear combination of various Gaussians with centers in different parts. Now, if you have the sigma is very large, what it means is that you're using really large Gaussians with sort of high variance to, to fit your function, which in the sense should make it hard to fit many functions because your functions are, the basis functions that you're using are extremely flat. On the, if sigma is very small, then you're really fitting uh, 
sort of these extremely skinny Gaussians at various points, which, and so there's a similar trade-off here. So if you choose a very large sigma, it means that you're not gonna have, you, you may have a large training error because function, fitting functions is harder, but, but your generalization is probably going to be good because you have a low complexity of your model. Whereas if you fit very skinny things, you could probably just, on all of the observed data point, fit something that fits it perfectly, but it's not going to generalize very well. So you don't sort of avoid this problem of training versus generalization at all by doing this. It just shows up in different ways in different places, depending on what you do with any of these. So in practice, no, the answer is you do cross-validation. That's the, that's the only answer. So you try different values of sigma, you train a classifier for every value of sigma, and you choose the one that, so you, you have your training data, you hide 10% of it or something, and, and that's basically what you would do. Okay. Right, so all these bounds tell us something in terms of sigma, but you know, often they're very loose. So they, they're really qualitatively explaining the story, and you, you wouldn't really want to choose the numbers that pop out of these things to precisely to tune these values. So. Okay, so move on to neural networks. Me add that I'm not going to say anything very, very much about neural networks. Certainly I'm not going to explain how they're used in practice for the most part. Um, so what is a neural network? Well, let's start from that and very soon I'm just going to say that the neural network is simply a composition of some, some certain kinds of functions. So a single unit in a neural network has basically two components. So there is a linear function which can be high dimensional, so it takes some vector and maps it to a, to a real number it's an, and it's a linear map. And then you take some nonlinear activation function, which I'll call A. And so it's an affine map, and you apply an activation function to it. And, and the combination of this is what's typically called as a unit. So that's a unit means that. Okay. So it's a com composition of an affine map and an activation function. And there's a variety of activation functions you could use. Sort of the most common ones are either the logistic sigmoid, which is given by this, or, or just ReLU. So ReLUs are more very fashionable these days, and a ReLU is nothing but, or it's, it should call it a rectifier. The ReLU is the entire unit, which is just max of 0, x. So it looks, so this is the activation function that it looks like. So this is the rectifier, and this is what the sigmoid will look like. So sigmoid takes a real number, squashes it between zero and one. So it's, it's very useful to convert real numbers into probabilities. And ReLU is, does something strange, which I must confess I don't fully understand, but that's, that's the function that the rectifier does, okay? Right, so that's the fundamental unit of a neural network and the way people construct these networks is just put lots and lots of them together. And typically, in a layered architecture, the, in practice, the ones that work very well on hard problems, which we can't solve otherwise, usually use what are called as convolutional neural networks, which is something different, which, which I won't really talk about today. And so, but la the layered neural networks look something like this. So these are called, so the ones in the middle are called hidden layers because you never actually observe anything from them. So you have the input on the one side and you have the outputs which are given by whatever target labels you're given in the supervised setting, but you don't observe anything that should happen going on in the middle. So they're called hidden layers. And really there's connections between every unit in one layer to the next layer. Typically there are no skip connections, but basically if you, you know, given that there is about 5,000 papers submitted to NIPS, there's probably going to be any possible architecture that you can imagine that's being considered by someone at some point of time. So, yeah, so this is really sort of the simplest possible thing. This is not what people mean by neural networks. This is not the only thing people mean by neural networks when they talk about neural networks. In this. Okay. okay, so, so um, I'll focus only on fully connected, what are called as feed-forward neural networks, so there's no loops. So you don't have, uh, so this, you can think of everything as a directed acyclic graph. And, and we have some nonlinear activation applied element-wise. So in principle, it's also possible to apply 
nonlinear activations and multiple units at the same time, but I'm going to think of these activations applying individually to each unit, not more than one unit at the same time. Okay, so please stop me if there's things that I, again, as I said, this is, this is one area where there's particularly a lot of jargon involved, so it's somehow a bit risky to... Um, so a layer, for my purposes, simply a, a nonlinear map applied element-wise to a vector, which is obtained by applying an affine function. So W here is a matrix, so Z is a vector, B is a vector, so you get a new vector and you apply this nonlinear activation element-wise. So you go from a layer that has D1 units to a layer that has D2 units through this process. Okay, so that's, that tells you how you go from one layer to another. And yes? Yes, okay, so, 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 so the suggestion is that do we really need to keep these B terms explicitly everywhere? And the answer is no, you don't need to, but it's, this is more common in, in the neural networks literature, so I'll just, I'm just keeping that. So uh, you can avoid keeping this constant explicitly by just adding the feature one to every of your data, and then essentially you can simulate those constant terms using that. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so that's a single layer, and your L layer, L hidden layer neural network is simply a composition of all of these, right? So you start with some input, apply L1, L2, L1, and so on, until you get the penultimate layer. And the last layer, I'm assuming there's a single output unit, and that's simply an affine map. So there's no nonlinearity involved at the output level. So, it's, so that's all a neural network is, right? So, this is, so this represents, these are the kinds of functions that are represented by, by neural networks. Okay. Good. Okay, so I'm guessing maybe you saw this morning a result that said something like this. Ben, did you cover this? Or? Yeah. Okay, so, right. So if you, so if you use all nonlinearities as being the sine function, then, then you actually get Boolean functions out of uh, neural networks. And, well, actually only the output has to have a non uh, sine function to it, but in any case, if you have, said, have sign for all of the nonlinearities, then you get, uh, you get a Boolean function and you can get, define the class of all neural networks that can be realized in a certain, by using a certain number of units, a certain number of parameters, and you can bound its VC dimension by what I hope is correct. And so, that's, so, so you just basically something that depends on the total number of parameters in your model, and that's, that controls it. And, okay, so that's good. Uh, this is typically a very large number, right? So this for, for units, that, for networks that are used in practice, the number of parameters is often much larger than the number of training samples. And, and this is you know, quite an unsolved problem yet, is why don't neural networks overfit so badly in some sense? Because sort of these kinds of bounds don't immediately tell us what they, what, why they don't overfit, neither will any of the bounds that I'm, going to, I'm about to show you in, in, the, in any case. Um, but we can also try and compute the Radomacher complexity of neural networks, and I'd rather have, okay, I'm gonna try and leave this as an exercise on how to compute this, but um, I'll try to give a few hints along the way of how to actually do this. So, so I'm gonna look at a class of functions represented by feedforward neural networks with L minus one hidden layers with the following property. So every row of any weight matrix that appears in this network should have the L1 norm bounded by W. So this one norm is slightly strange, but it's important to do the calculations, at least in this particular set of calculations correctly. So, it's, so, so all this is saying is that, so, so, so remember that So the nonlinear map I'm using were of the type W times Z plus B. And so the, the row of, any row of W is what's multiplying this vector Z. So, so the Z I'm going to assume has, uh, will, well, it will turn out that it has a low infinity norm, which is why you want a one norm on the rows of W. So really what you care about is somehow being able to bound the inner products of these quantities. So if you get, 
And so, so you can either have two norm and two norm or one norm and an infinity norm. So, so every bias vector in this, so that vector B there, also needs to have a bound, this time on the infinity norm. So every single element of B has to have absolute value bounded by some number B. All the activations in, your, in the network have to be one Lipschitz, so, so they can't increase very rapidly or decrease very rapidly, so they have to be somewhat smooth. And the inputs must satisfy that the infinity norm of all of the inputs is at most one. Okay, so there's, there's a, quite a bit of conditions. So it's a, but this, all of these together will allow you to bound the rather macro complexity by what looks like something even, even more tricky. But okay, so here's the expression. It's, you know, it's not that hard to prove this result actually, but it's worth noting that there is an exponential dependence here on, on L, which is the number of layers. So, so unless you have a reasonably shallow network, this is going to grow very fast indeed. Um, there's also the sum over L entities. And so that's, that's, the, that's the main problem there, right? So, so, so the, otherwise the dependence on B and W is okay, but there's an exponential dependence on, on the number of hidden layers in, in the matrix, in, in the neural network. And, and so that means that in general for deep, very deep neural networks, this could be, this could be very large. Yes. I don't, I wouldn't say that. So, um, so I mean, okay, so, so if, if these are the only things that you assume, and you're, then probably yes. But so the real question here is that what are the correct kind of assumptions that you should be making on, on the kind of things you're doing, right? So, and, and that's still a very much unresolved question to some extent. So, so, what are, so the kind of regularization that would, is typically applied to weight parameters, well, even the classical things, right? So some of squares of the weights and so on. You can also do that for neural networks, and indeed people do. But other kinds of things, uh, um, like dropout or things, I don't even know how to put them in this kind of a framework to understand what kind of regularization that they're doing. So, okay, so this is, so I wouldn't take this as kind of any definitive answer on what is going on with generalization abilities of neural networks. Okay, so here's the exercise. Um, so there's a couple of things that you need to use in order to prove this result. Um, so, the, okay, so what you want to prove is that if G bar is a function class that you get by getting all possible convex combinations of um, functions in G. So G is a class of functions, G bar is obtained by taking all convex combinations of functions in G. Then, then the rather macro complexity is actually the same for both of these classes. So it doesn't change. So taking, yes? Yeah. Well, I guess I wouldn't have this dependence on the number of layers. It's mm. a typical bounds for the VC dimension, which is the sort of number of parameters. Number of neurons on parameters. Yeah. So, I, so I guess there, so, so the, the dependence on the number of layers there. So, so the no, the, there is no dependence on the number of parameters here somehow, right? So that's hidden away again through the through the norms, right? So in general, if you use lots of hidden units, it's likely that the L1 norm of the vectors your network is using grows. But there's no explicit dependence on the number of units or number of parameters anywhere in this, in this bound. So, yeah, so. So it's. Yes? Uh, from, the from the previous lemma about uh, uh, composition and uh, those. Uh, mm -hmm. Ah, uh, for, for uh, anyway, does it mean that uh, oh, uh, if the function is, say, uh, C lips, lip, lip shit, yep. uh we can take this bound and multiply it by C? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so, so I think in, in general, so, so the bound on the Lipschitz constant and the bound on the norm of the vector is, uh, you really need only one of them. You can always set one of them to be one because you can always, so if you wanted the function activation to be you know, three Lipschitz, you can always allow W to be three times W. 
and then you basically achieve the same thing because you're that's what the, that's the scaling you're doing. So in that sense, it so it's the, the bound a being one left is more or less without loss of linearity as as long as you're willing to sort of you agree that this this w there will then change because of that kind of constraint. So okay, so so that's so that's the rather macro complexity of. Uh, these kinds of neural networks, and there's sort of many papers on this area. I've, I've, uh, I've put links to a few of them in the bibliography, which should be available. Um, let me say a little bit about sort of more classical theory of what has been considered in neural networks, and this is now moving away from the kind of generalization bounds we've focused on, but really trying to understand representation, right? So, so, so what is it that got people excited about neural networks several times in the last you know, 50 or so years at different periods? And so, so one of these phases was sort of dominated by what, these kind of universality results. So there were many of them that were very similar that came out roughly at the same time. This particular version is due to Sibenko. And, and basically, this is a slightly simplified version of it, which says that if you look at just a network with one hidden layer, so no, you don't need multiple layers, n nothing that kind, so just a single hidden layer, and the logistic sigma is the activation function, but the result is actually a lot more general. You can use other kinds of activation functions as long as they satisfy some basic properties. Then if you look at the set of functions that can be represented by linear combinations of this form, so alpha times this, this unit given here by sigmoid applied to some lin affine function, um, and n can be some arbitrary integer, so there's no bound in the number n, then the, fu the functions of this kind are dense in the set of all continuous functions on the unit cube in Rn. So, so this is, so this is the, in, in this sense, this is a universality result, that you, this, you can approximate all continuous functions in, on the unit cube in Rn, or in general in any compact set. And it's, you know, so it's like the kind of approximations by polynomials or trigonometric functions going back to Weierstrass. And so this is sort of got people excited because in principle neural networks can represent anything that we might care to, to learn. But this also means that their generalization will be, could in principle be an issue. And indeed, nobody really uses <coughs> neural networks with one hidden layer in practice there. And, and there is no explicit bound on N. In fact, in fact, it is known that you require an exponentially many at least exponential in the dimension number of units for this for this kind of a result to hold. So you cannot represent arbitrarily well all continuous functions if the number of these units cannot is, is not allowed to grow at least exponentially in the dimension. So, so in fact, you know that you're going to require a very large number of units if you use one hidden layer. Yes. So, okay, so if you want an epsilon approximation to so un arbitrary continuous functions, then it's going to be something like one over epsilon to the dimension. So, so that's the so that's the result, and so it's so, it's, so these are very interesting, you know, from an understanding representation point of view. But it's it's less clear what they really tell us about well, two things, both about training algorithms because. It's not that these one-layer hidden neural networks are, are any easier to train. In fact, the, the practical viewpoint seems to be that actually deep neural networks are much easier to train than shallow ones. And, and there seems to be some reasons for that. But, so it's not that having a one hidden layer is actually very good from a training point of view. And it's also not clear that this is significantly better from the point of view of generalization. And again, there is, seems to be very little practical evidence from practice that very deep neural networks overfit a lot. So, so, this is, so these are all very interesting results, but it's, it's not so far it's unclear to what extent they actually explain what's going on in practice currently. Okay. Um, I'm not going to say, tell you much about because I don't understand it very much either, but um, okay, so we have these universality results and there's been some more recent work trying to understand this question, which is why is it that people are using deep neural networks and, and not shallow ones? And one possible explanation is that perhaps you, know, you could express a reasonably large class of functions which we care about learning uh, much better using sh deep networks than using shallow networks. Um, and this is sort of the line of work that has been followed by a few people. 
And so in particular, I want to point out two results, and there's, there's a few more, so it's not, I, these are not necessarily my, uh, my favorite results or anything, but I just wanted to pick one or two of them. And so the first result uh, by Eldan and Shamir established that there's some function, actually it's, uh, it's somehow related to these sort of functions that are symmetric uh, in Rn, so they only depend on the distance from, from the origin, and there's a specific kinds of functions. So there are these functions that can be well approximated by, by depth three neural networks. So depth three here means two hidden layers. So usually the depth is always the number of hidden layers plus one. Uh, so you can, by using polynomially many units in the dimension, but require exponentially many, many units if you use a depth two network. Right? So, so at least, you know, so we know that depth two circuits are universal if we don't constrain the number of units, but there are functions which actually have a fairly small representation for depth using depth three networks, but require an exponentially large representation if you're restricted to depth two networks. Um, so there's sort of a similar kind of result. So this applies to almost all activation kinds of active, the first one, Eldan and Shamir's result applies to almost all kinds of activation results used in practice. Um, the result by Talgarski is, is slightly, well, it's incomparable in the sense that it shows things for depth that is not just two and three, so it shows for any k there is some kind of a separation, but the separation is also not as stark as k and k plus one. It shows that there is functions that can be represented well by a depth k cube neural network, but not, but not using a depth k neural network. Right? So, there's, so there's a large gap between the two, two depths there, whereas in the original result it's only a gap of one, but there's this kind of concrete numbers two and three, whereas this holds for any k. And again, sort of the idea is that these kinds of results, you know, they're, they're, they're somehow in, somewhat involved, but the key idea in many of this and similar results is to look at oscillating functions. And, and these are very hard to express using shallow networks, but somehow get easier with deep networks. So, so composition is very helpful if you want to create more and more oscillations, whereas linear combinations are not. And that's sort of the key idea that goes on to proving these kinds of results. So, so these are the kinds of functions that are going to be hard to represent by shallow networks, whereas deep, some deep networks can represent some kinds of functions that look like this. So that's, that's the general favor of these kinds of results. Okay, so I want to sort of move on to maybe algorithmic stability and for the next 10, 15 minutes, I want to talk about um, a different way of proving generalization bounds, which was really originated by Bousquet and Elisev. So, so, so far the results that we've seen are of the following kind. So either the ones using VC dimension that you may have seen this morning or the ones using rather macro complexity is that you take some class of functions, you want to look at some conditions, so there's some complexity measure on these class of functions, and you need some possibly some conditions on the kind of data that you have, maybe some Lipschitz conditions and so on, but fine. But as for some conditions, with high probability for every F in this class, the, the actual risk and the empirical risk are close to each other. So this is what all of these results have been of this flavor, right? So this is, these are uniform convergence bound, they hold for all F in this class. And in some sense, it's nice because they're very powerful, but one might also ask whether this is sort of too powerful or too, and maybe we might get away with using different kinds of analyses that, that actually don't, maybe are not as powerful, but are still sufficient to prove generalization for the kind of algorithms that we actually use. And that's the idea we want to, want to develop. So these kinds of results only develop, only depend on the some kind of a complexity or capacity measures of the class of functions used by the learning algorithm, but not on the learning algorithm itself. So it doesn't matter what learning algorithm you use, as long as you promise me that the learning algorithm is going to pick some function from this class of functions, these bounds hold. But we might want to look specifically at the, some kinds of learning algorithms and see whether we can analyze algorithms directly to say something about generalization rather than only looking at, at classes of functions and saying something about generalization. Okay, so so let's so this is what so algorithmic stability is a notion that try, that tries to make use of this. So so let S be some sample x1, y1 through xn, ym, 
and it's drawn from some distribution over x cross y. And s prime is a sample that's exactly the same as s, but it differs on exactly on just one point. Right? So apart from that one point, it's exactly the same. Instead of the point xm ym, it has the point x prime m y prime. Okay, so we're looking at learning algorithms, possibly randomized. So you take some sample and you can output some function um, on it. So we have some cost function as Leah. And using these, we want to define this notion of uniform stability, which is the following. So let's pass this again. So the learning algorithm is uniformly beta stable if you have any such sample. So samples S and S prime size m which differ on exactly one point, and in, then for any point x, y, so x, y are not here in, in the sample, x, y is any point in x cross y, uh, you want that the cost of, if you apply the classifier returned by the algorithm on the set s, or, or any function, it doesn't have to be a classification problem, the function returned by the algorithm on s prime, if you apply this, then you get that the difference is at most beta. Okay, so let's sort of try and understand what this definition is saying a little bit before we try to talk about any results. So, so why might something like this be useful for, for generalization, right? So, so what this is saying is that if, you know, so this is some kind of a closeness condition on what happens. So if you have two data sets that don't differ too much, then, then you're, somehow also returning algorithms as sort of outputs that, that are not too different. And, and this means that, well, okay, so that's good. But what do these data sets differ on? Well, they differ on one point. And this is also a way of saying that, well, actually your function cannot depend too much on one specific point in that case, right? And that's kind of exactly what we want from things that are algorithms that won't overfit, right? So you don't want your, you know, so, so, the output of your algorithm to depend too much on one point or maybe a small number of points of your training data set. Somehow you wanted to make use of the full training data set in some meaningful way and not on some specific part of it. And that's, that's the kind of thing that's coming out of this definition. Okay, so that's what we want to choose. Um, well, it depends on what beta, what we want out of beta, but we will want beta to be small, typically. So something that is smaller than one over square root of m. Okay, and so let me, so this is just the same definition. Uh, so let me say, say the theorem, which I'm not going to prove, but this is uh, Buske and Elisev, which says that if you have um, gamma is some bounded cost function, so the cost can never be larger than m, some m, and if this algorithm A is uniformly beta stable, now if you take some sample from this distribution, then for any delta greater than zero with probability at least one minus delta, it holds that that the risk of the, uh, the output of this algorithm can be bounded by the empirical risk plus beta plus this quantity 2m times beta plus m over this. Okay, so, so what's important to note here is that there is no for all f in f here. So it's really just talking about the output of this algorithm and we can, it directly bounds the risk of this, of this output of this algorithm based on the property of the algorithm. Not, so the algorithm could output to what, might, to what might seem to us like a very complicated thing, some arbitrary polynomial size circuit or something, but as long as the algorithm has some stability properties, you can still get a result like this, right? Okay, so this, this beta times m here, together with the square root of m in this last term, also shows that beta should be smaller than one over square root of m, otherwise you will get nothing non-trivial out of this kind of a bound, right? And this also means that, yes? Sorry, robustness or something I'm not exactly sure what you mean by robustness here, but. Right, so, so it doesn't make the same decision, right? But it's, it, I mean, in some sense, yes, it's saying that what your output is not going to be too different in a certain metric. So in that sense, yes, it is a, like a robustness condition. But, but we can talk about this afterwards if there's this, right? Um, 
Right, so, okay, so, so the, you need, we want beta to be smaller than this, which also means that you cannot use it for zero one classification loss at all, right? So why? Well, if you look at this definition, right, so for, if you, for zero one classification loss, if you look at this gamma here, well, you either get zero or one, right? So you either have the same prediction or not. And since this has to hold for any two samples that differ by exactly one point, the only way to achieve beta stability for any beta that's less strictly less than one would mean if your algorithm always outputs a constant classifier. So there is, it's not really a learning algorithm at all. It just outputs a fixed, fixed classifier. So in that sense, you can't really apply directly to the zero one loss, but for, for, for losses that use, even if it's a classification problem, if you use different loss functions or things like hinge loss or something for SVM, you might be able to apply this kind of results, but you can't directly apply it to the zero one loss. Okay, so so I don't want to, I'm not going to prove this theorem. It's there in the, it's actually there also in one of the textbooks that's referenced, and also in the original paper by Buske and Elisif. Uh, both are fairly easy to read. So I want to just show how one can look at um, ridge regression and through this angle, and then I'll say a few more words and stop. So so this is one last notion that I want to talk about, which is um, for sigma admissible cost function. And, and there should be a, okay, there's a couple of missing things on that slide. So there should be a, uh, what is it? So there's a gamma, a, a, a gamma missing and a free parenthesis. Okay, let me write that for this. This is uh, what it should be. So it should be gamma f prime x y minus gamma f x y is less than sigma times what this is the correct thing. Okay, so, so that's, what we, that's what we want, uh, is the definition of sigma admissibility. So it's really like a <coughs> Lipschitzness condition on gamma, right? So you, so you want to say that if you change by, so the difference between the loss or the cost function on f and f prime that that difference can't be larger than sigma times the difference in the f prime of x and f of x. Okay. Okay. So so we want to see if use this for ridge regression. So what is ridge regression? So let's try and and this again. So we've seen what linear regression is. So we look at looked at linear regression from as a constrained optimization problem. So we are trying to minimize the squared error constraint for. Uh, with the constraint that the vector w that we find should be in a ball of radius w. Uh, what's more common in practice is not this kind of a constrained optimization problem, but an unconstrained one with this regularization term. So you would have this squared loss as we, uh, as we saw, plus lambda times norm of w square as, as a penalty term. And what you're trying to find is a minimizer of this, this particular objective function. Right? So, so there's a couple of things that we want to note. So if, if we have that the, the norm of x is, sorry, not w, x is bounded and y is also bounded, then, then any minimizer of this loss, you can bound the squared norm of the, minima, of the output of the minimizer. Okay, so, so why is this? It's not, that hard to see. So, so think of what happens when you set W to zero. Okay, so if you set W to zero, you get, you know, you're predicting a zero for every single point, but Y is at most M. So maybe you pay M square as overall, and uh, that's fine. Uh, but then you don't pay anything in the second term because W is zero, right? So any vector that you find must at least satisfy that lambda times W square. So the minimizer must satisfy that lambda times W square is less than m square. And so actually, if you solve this problem, once you fix lambda, you do get a bound on, on the minimizer that you're going to get. Okay, so, so that's good. So why do we want that? Well, if we have a bound on the minimizer, then we know that f prime of x can't be predicting very large values because the value of f prime of x can only be as large as the value of w dot x minus y, so that's that can all be bounded. And, and that's good because as long as you can get a bound on that and we're using the squared loss, uh, 
then it's going to be sigma admissible because as long as we're looking at the quadratic function on the bounded interval, it's always going to have a fixed Lipschitz constant that we can use. It's, as if it's not on all of R, but on a bounded interval, it's fine. And so, so the really the key point there is to get, get a, a bound on the, on the minimizer of this. And, and then we can use a result, again, by Bousquet and Elisev, which happens if gamma happens to be convex. So we need gamma to be convex for this result. And sigma admissible, then, then ridge regression is actually uh, beta stable. So in this case, gamma is indeed convex with with beta being something like sigma square x square lambda, but the important thing is there's m in the denominator. So you get actually a very high stability. So, so we know that anything less than one over square root of m is good enough, but here actually we get something, something as, as good as possible, which is something like one over, one over m. Okay, so that's, and this is sort of different from the kind of results that we've seen in the first part, which is not, we're not saying anything about function classes. What we're really saying is that this algorithm is going to find a minimizer of this thing, and the minimizer has certain properties. So we're not saying about properties of all linear functions necessarily, um, but about the specific kind of algorithm, and this will, this will be beta stable. So not every W will be beta stable, but, but the minimizer will be. Okay. So I just want to point out again sort of a recent paper by uh, Hart, Recht, and Singer, which has, again, used this idea of algorithmic stability and shown that if you, if you analyze stochastic gradient descent directly, and you have to change the notion of uniform stability a little bit because it's a randomized algorithm, so you won't have to do a few things in expectation rather than saying that it always holds, but, but basically using the same kind of idea of algorithmic stability, um, they've shown that stochastic gradient descent with early stopping is uniformly stable, right? So this, this gives you some kind of generalization bounds if you use stochastic gradient descent to do optimization. And it's the same kind of idea. And you know, so there's so this one kind of view that if we do want to understand why neural networks you know, don't overfit that badly, we might have to look at the algorithms that we're using to train them rather than just their capacity. And this is definitely in, in that vein, this kind of a result. Okay, so here's just to summarize, so what we saw in the, so in the first part, so we saw the uniform convergence bounds to, as a tool to bound generalization error. So generalization error is the difference between the empirical risk and the true risk, and the other way around, uh, using rather macro complexity bounds, and we applied these bounds to a variety of machine learning methods, so linear regression, generalized linear models, support vector machines, and, and then said a few things about neural networks and it's still very much an active area of research. We don't have definitive answers to many questions surrounding neural networks, certainly not from a theoretical point of view. And at the very end, I talked a little bit about algorithmic stability as, as a different way of achieving gen ways to get gen bound generalization error, which is different from the uniform convergence. Okay, so thanks very much. And